Okay, so hi again, everyone. And uh, this is where I am based. Um, let me just see if I can move this panel somewhere else so it doesn't bother me so much. Okay, uh, so I'm at the University of Surrey. I mean, um, right now I'm 10 minutes away from the University of Surrey at home. But this is our campus, uh, bird's eye view of our campus. As you can see, we're in the middle of the beautiful English countryside. And if you don't know where the University of Surrey is, um, you can see it here. Um, it's, we are just 40 minutes away from London by train. Um, okay, so I'm going to start talking about academic English collocations by giving you a little exercise. So please fill in the gaps with the first word that comes to your mind, just in your minds. Okay. It doesn't matter if you haven't got the all, all, all the answers, no one's seeing what you're doing. Um, let's talk a little bit about this exercise. Um, what kind of English do you think these gapped sentences are about? And do you think you can fit in more than one word in each gap? So think of these questions and let's check your answers. Okay, so for the first gap, these are some possible answers. Um, maybe it matches one of the words you chose. Here are possible answers for the second gap, third gap, here in sentence four, here in sentence five. So you see up to now, um, all the gaps admit more than one word. However, when we come to this grammatical gap, only one word is possible. And here again, only one word is possible. So what we're talking about here are gaps for testing your recall of academic English collocations. And whereas lexical collocations are usually more than one that can fit in a gap, uh, grammatical collocations tend to be a little bit more restric restricted. Uh, but what exactly does collocation mean? So I'm using the term here in the Ferdian sense to refer to lexical items or words that occur together more frequently than just by chance. So how can you check this? Well, normally your intuitions will tell you what is normal to use together and what's not normal, but you can also check this against corpus data. So if you look at these two uh, combinations of words, light increase and slight increase, try and think which one sounds more idiomatic to you. And now let's check this against a corpus. So if we look this up, and I'm talking here about academic English, if we, so we need a corpus of academic English, and I'm looking this up in the Oxford corpus of academic English. So if you look up the word light, it occurs almost 1500 times in this corpus. The word slight is a lot less frequent. You can see here just over a thousand times it occurs in the corpus. But if you check how often light and slight occur one word to the left of increase, as in light increase or slight increase, this you, is what you get. Only once light increase and 97 times slight increase. So you can see that one seems to be more normal than the other one. And if you're not convinced, you can also use uh, statistics to check if the relation is significant. Now, using the log dice score, which is um, known to be the most suitable for lexical analyses, 
you have here a 0 0.7 score, which is not significant against, oops, I can't see because the, okay, 8.92. It, it's just that the um, uh, Zoom commands are covering the bottom right corner of my screen. So you can see it's a lot more significant. Okay, so let's talk about collocations and language learning. Uh, collocations are notably difficult for second language learners. So some of you who are not so fluent in academic English might have had a little trouble with the exercise I gave right at the beginning of this talk. And second language learners, sometimes they lack awareness of collocation constraints. So they can use certain words together without realizing that they clash. And this happens very often when first and second language collocations are clash. For example, in English, we say depend on something. And in Portuguese, we say depender de algo, which is translating literally depend of something. So many Portuguese speakers of English make this mistake to depend of something. Uh, collocations and reading. How does it affect your reading? Well, I'll give you a little test again. Which of these is easier to read? Okay. There's not much difference between these two sentences. The only difference is in number one, you have fine use. In number two, effective use. And in number one, highly improve. And in number two, greatly improve. So in number one, you have some very odd word combinations. And in number two, you have perfectly idiomatic academic English collocations. So what happens is that word combinations that are known are processed with less effort and they enhance readability, making collocationally rich texts being perceived as more fluent. How about academic writing? What's happening here? Well, um, I did some research with uh, a colleague from Brazil who I hope is in the audience today, Paula Tavares Pinto. She was here on a sabbatical with me at Surrey for uh, some time last year. And we looked at Brazilian uh, researchers writing in English um, so we looked at a corpus of publications by Brazilian researchers uh, taken from the Cielo database. And we found that their they didn't have wrong collocations. There are very little evidence of miscollocations of errors, but we found evidence of a limited collocation repertoire uh, about misconceived ideas about collocation strength. So they were overemphasizing certain collocations and underemphasizing others. And collocation avoidance, not using some collocations that were actually even very similar to Portuguese collocations. But the problem is not just with second language users of academic English. We also have evidence that undergraduates who are native speakers of English or English as the first language users, um, if they are students just beginning to become acquainted with academic discourse, they too experience collocation difficulties. So uh, the message to take home is that there are no native speakers of academic English. It's your experience with academic English that really makes a big difference. Uh, so both undergraduate students who are new to academic English and even researchers who can be quite experienced, but they're not so used to talking about their work in English, they can benefit from academic English collocation assistance. And there are lots of resources available to help you with collocations, but um, as usual, they have some limitations. So let's talk a little bit first about English for Academic Purposes or EAP textbooks. They have sections on vocabulary, very good sections, but sometimes they can only fit in 
a limited amount of information about collocation. There's no space. And then when you're writing a, a paper or an essay, you're not going to consult your EAP textbook. It's not very practical. Then you have dictionaries. These are more practical to consult as you write. Uh, the problem is that general and English for academic purposes dictionaries, um, they have a collocation section, but such often secondary and very frequently hard to find. The priority is given to meaning. Collocation is usually hidden away at the end of an entry. And also there's limited space, so limited coverage of collocation. Then you have collocation dictionaries. There are some excellent collocation dictionaries available, but most of them focus on general English and not specifically on academic English. There's one dictionary, however, the Longman Collocations Dictionary, which has an appendix with 200, almost 205,000 academic English collocations, which you can look up. And you can also look, if you don't use these resources, you can also use uh, corpora to look up collocations. However, as uh, people who are not familiar with corpora know, it's not, they're not very intuitive in general. They're not really as accessible to lay people. And the data from corpora is noisy. You get errors, you get uh, wrong uh, information and irrelevant information. It's hard to interpret corpus data for those who are not familiar with corpora. Then learners don't always know how to select an appropriate corpus. So if you select the wrong corpus, you won't get good results. Learners don't always know how to build corpus queries. Even experienced corpus linguists, uh, sometimes it takes them two or three goes to refine a query and make a query uh, retrieve exactly what they want. And it's very easy to misinterpret corpus data, especially among students. And another thing, you can just get distracted by corpus data so you end up, you know, lost in the corpus and you forget why you were using the corpus in the first place. There are also some corpus-based tools geared to collocation lookups. For example, I don't know if you've seen just the word. It was one of the first tools that became available. More recently, Scale, Sketch Engine for English Language Learning, and Flax, the Flax Library from the New Zealand team. And these are really good collocation resources where you access collocations without really having to understand much about corpus linguistics. However, sometimes what's behind these tools is not always the best corpus. General corpora or just student corpora, you don't have the corpora of expert writing. And again, as with, you, as with corpora in general, you get noisy data. What's more, Academic writing is a complex task. So looking up collocations can interrupt what your thoughts and the flow of what you're saying. And if you're not aware that you have a collocation problem, you won't look anything up. You just will carry on writing unaware. And there's evidence that learners tend to overestimate their knowledge of collocations. So here is an alternative solution, collocate.
Okay, so um, I hope this gives you an overview of Collocate. So what's really different about it? It can help writers expand their collocation repertoire because it gives you reminders and suggestions of collocations that you don't remember or that you don't feel confident enough to use or are unreasonably avoiding. And it does so in a non-intrusive way. So you can just ignore the underlinings if you want to, or you can carry on. The lexicographic data behind Collocate is curated. So you don't get distracted with information that is hard to find or information that is irrelevant, misleading, or just too much information. Another thing, it's based on the concept of data-driven learning. So collocations are shown to you. We're not explaining what collocations are. And there's lots of evidence that learners value example and they actually prefer learning from examples than from explanations. And there's also evidence that multiple examples help more. So we tend to give more than one example. Also, Collocate has interactive text editor integration. So it works in real time and you don't have to stop writing to look something up. And it's informed by human computer interaction research. So let me tell you a little bit about the methodology behind uh, Collocate. So this is how we started. Um, we started not from the collocation, but from the collocation node. So uh, that's because people normally ask questions like the second one rather than the first one. And we wanted to include around 500 really useful general academic English nodes in our project because we only had 36 months to carry it out, limited resources, so we focused on noun, verbs, and adjectives, which are collocationally more productive. We are not looking at adverbs because you don't normally start a sentence from an adverb, start a collocation from an adverb. And we, to select those nodes, we used three well-established word lists of general academic English vocabulary. And these lists, they're extracted using different methods in different corpora, and our aim was simply to build on the strengths of each list. So we use the academic keyword list developed by Magali Paco in Belgium, and its focus is on academic keyness, on words that are particularly salient in academic English when compared with general language. We use a subset of Gardner and Davis's academic vocabulary list, which is too big. It contains 3,000 lemmas and we couldn't use them all. We didn't have time. So we used a subsection that overlaps with student writing from the British Academic Written English Corpus. So that's univer UK university student writing. So the emphasis here is on novice academic writing vocabulary. And we use the ACL, the Academic Collocations List, developed by Ackerman and Chen, using the 704 headwords that are listed in the appendix to the Longman's Collocation Dictionary, which I already mentioned. So for conduct research, we use the node research. And its emphasis is obviously from the way it was extracted on strong collocations. So we looked at how the lists intersected and we found that uh, nodes intersecting in at least two lists gave us a total of 514, which was very close to our tag target. So we were very happy about that. So which collocations did we focus on? We focus on the collocates that are likely to be looked up for each node. So lexical collocations, and we didn't look at uh, discipline, but just general lexical collocations like nouns and verbs, nouns and adjectives, verbs and adverbs, adjectives and adverbs. And also we looked at grammatical collocations, for example, verbs and prepositions. 
Um, okay. Uh, and which sources did we use? We used expert academic English corpora, like the uh, academic section of the BNC, the academic section of COCA. Uh, there's also, we gained permission to use the Pearson International Corpus of Academic English. And we were also granted permission to use the Oxford Corpus of Academic English in our research. So these last two, they are proprietary. They're not open access. So, and we kindly got permission to use them. And I put the Oxford one in bold because this one is the one that we relied on most for Collocate, although we did use all corpora. It has 70 million words. It's, those words come from published papers and books, not just native speaker English, you know, just expert academic English, which includes many second language English researchers but their English is good enough to be published in Oxford journals. And this has uh, 26 different disciplines are represented, from biochemistry to sociology. Which tools did we use? We use Sketch Engine, which gives you word sketches where the collocates of a node are sorted per grammar relation. So if we look at the node research, we can get a list of all the adjectives that are used with it, like this. And here at the side, we have very important figures, which are co-occurrence. So qualitative and research co-occur 1,500 times in the corpus and the log die statistics. So you can see here, this is a very significant value. Uh, and which collocates did we choose? Um, we uh, used the log dice score as a threshold, so it, log dice had to be five or over, and we rank the collocations in terms of uh, collocation strength. So primary aim is stronger than ultimate aim, stronger than explicit aim, and it gets, you know, the strongest one is always the top one. And we also use a threshold, which we arrived at just by trial and error. What worked well in, this, in the Oxford corpus was looking for collocation frequency, uh, co-occurrence frequency of at least 10, uh, if it was a lexical collocation, and of at least 100, if it was a grammatical collocation. And to make sure we covered interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary collocations, we had a dispersion criteria. The collocation had to figure in at least three different disciplines. Um, which examples did we use? Um, we focused on curating examples for the top eight collocations shown. And you can see here examples for over, overarching aim. And what's specific about these examples is that they come from expert writing corpora with some light editorial intervention to make them short uh, so that there's less effort to process, so that they're less distracting for writers and that so that they save screen space. We also wanted to make sure the examples were transferable to other disciplines. So even if you see an example from biology, you can use it a similar, in a similar way in uh, linguistics. And we wanted to promote data-driven learning. So we are providing three similar examples because that clinches it, that helps you understand how to use it. And uh, whenever possible, showing colligation cues. So the grammatical contexts of the collocation. And to help us, we use GoodX, which is Good Dictionaries Examples, the technology developed by Sketch Engine. So this is our current uh, database of version 0 0.6 of Collocate. We have uh, 561 academic lemmas, and it looks just not much, but it's very productive because they give rise to 32,000 collocation suggestions. That's actually just nearly 30,000 more collocations than in the academic collocation list. And of those 
2,000 collocation suggestions, around 9,000 have curated corpus examples, three examples of, it, of which, so we have almost 30,000 curated corpus examples. Even if the examples are not curated, all the collocations, suggestions given are also linked to non-curated examples uh, from scale, from the scale corpus. How did we develop the prototype? Well, writers have different preferences. Some prefer Windows and Microsoft Word. Some prefer Mac and prefer writing in LaTeX. Uh, I'm talking about academic writers. And um, what we did is we used a, um, a text editor that is compatible with a browser, like we use Tiny Mice, which is open source. Um, and uh, this was good because you can use it from any device, any operating system. You can even use it on your phone, although I wouldn't recommend writing an academic paper on your phone. And it has a familiar interface with all the usual things that uh, text ed editors do. So it was great for prototype testing. And there are some concepts of human inter computer interaction which helped us. One was Fitt's law, which says that the time it takes to acquire a target is a function of the distance to and the size of the target. So dictionary users normally have to cover a very long distance to find a collocation. They have to stop writing, go to the dictionary, look up a head word, scroll down to the collocation section, identify the target collocation, and go back to writing. If you're using a corpus, that's the same. You stop writing, go to corpus, select query type, carry out query, interpret raw corpus data that can take a while, and then you go back to your writing. In Collocate, our interactive menus, they reduce this distance, okay? So you find a collocation, uh, when you see a word, a node like advantage, you immediately see the top verb that occurs with advantage, the top adjective, and some of the most frequent prepositions. If you're interested in the adjective and it's not the top one, which you could use there and there, the menu expands and it gives you a further eight. And if it's not there in the top eight, and these are the strongest eight, you can always click for more. So uh, you can use as much and interact as much as you like with Collocate. Maybe the first menu will help and you can carry on writing. Maybe you can you will need to investigate further until you find the perfect collocation. Another concept that was useful for us was the working memory, where um, it's well known that average, on average, people can remember seven plus or minus two items in their minds. So in Collocade, our interactive menus have no more than eight items listed. Um, so it's easy to read all of them at once. You don't have to scroll up and down, except the final menu, of course, with the extra collocations. Another concept was mental model, um, what, meaning what a user believes about a system strongly impacts how they use it. And uh, derived from that is the concept of mental model confusion which is a gap between the designer's model and the user's model. So for example, in browsers, I don't know if you remember a long time ago, many people used to put their search query in the uh, browser uh, URL address instead, uh, in the address bar, um, and got it wrong. So they have, uh, because the browser developer thought there's a a bar for the URL and a bar for a search. But now uh, this has been overcome because the two work in the same way. Same thing in dictionaries. For example, a lexicographer will have very strong ideas of where in the dictionary to put an idiom like a stitch in time saves nine. However, a user might be a little bit lost and doesn't know whether to look up this, this idiom under stitch 
under time, under saves, nine, it's not as clear for a user. What happened in Collocade was that in early versions, we had underlined words in black and many people thought they were errors. They were not errors, they were just signs that there were collocation suggestions available for the words. So we changed the underlinings to green, green light, to make sure people did not think of these as errors. Another concept was the system usability scale, which is a tool to help measure the usability of any kind of system. And it works uh, uh, by measuring positive and negative statements about systems on a Likert scale, which is then converted into a score. So it's positive and negative, so as not to influence the respondent of the questionnaire. Uh, and I'll show you how. So it's a standard in usability testing. It's been referenced in hundreds of thousands of publications. So it makes systems comparable and is quick and cheap to administer and reliable with small sample sizes. Plus it measures what it claims to. So here's the screenshot. I don't know if you can read this, but you can see the alternating positive and negative statements. So I'll read the first two for you. I think that I would like to use collocate frequently, positive. I found collocate unnecessarily complex, negative. So you see how positive and negative alternates. So we did some user studies. Version 0 0.1 was tested in Poland and in France. Version 0 0.2 was tested in Brazil. Thanks to uh, Urgis and to UNESPI for helping with that. Version 0 0.3 was tested again in Brazil at USPI and, and uh, URGIS, sorry, and UNESPI, and then in Spain. And we had uh, 122 participants in all, uh, with first languages Polish, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, and they were users of academic English, uh, students, research fellows, and even professors. Uh, and we applied the system usability scale and some specific questions about collocate. So um, these are uh, the results uh, that we got. So you can see that the system was uh, considered between good and excellent uh, when it was tested for our early version 0 0.1 to 0 0.2. And since then, we have made available over 20,000 more collocation suggestions, plus links to external examples since those early tests. So a lot has happened since. So we hope to have achieved excellent or near excellent now. And we had some positive feedback, uh, user-friendly, lots of examples, intuitive, and here a reference to the interaction. I like it when it gives only one example to begin and then later you can get more if you need more. Uh, you don't waste time. And um, it gives me combinations of words that sound more formal than the ones I would think myself. So very interesting. It's doing what we wanted it to do. There were, however, suggestions for improvement. More words could be added to collocate, like academic words from specific areas. Well, as I said, the database has been greatly expanded since those tests, but we did not cover subject-specific terms. It was not our objective at this version of collocate to do something for specific subjects. Another comment, maybe it would be compatible with text editors we use daily, such as Microsoft Word, and we couldn't agree more. But at this stage, we're developing a prototype and we wanted it to be compatible with multiple systems um, so that we could develop real good testing. Install an auto-saving mechanism so that the text I'm composing is not damaged or lost. Um, here there are privacy and data protection issues because, you know, people are very zealous about their texts 
And we want to assure writers using Collocate that we cannot see what they're writing. They can write anything they want on Collocate and we can't see it. So there's that on the one hand. Uh, but we will be adding an export to text function soon so that users can regularly save uh, drafts of what they write on Collocate. Uh, another comment, the interface appearance could be more appealing um, and we're on it. So lately we have been developing alternative visualizations. So here's the tree view. So instead of seeing cascading menus uh, within your editor, you see a sidebar with a tree visualization on the side. So this is going to be available soon in version 0.6. And here's another one. This is a more experimental approach. We call it the bow tie view. We're still doing experiments with it. So who's using Collocade? Um, well, the prototype was first released to the public at ELEX 2019. That was in the end of September, beginning of October last year. And we haven't really broadly advertised it because it has still some bugs and it's a prototype. Currently, we are on version 0.5, uh, where the visualization options and the export function are still not available. And again, we still see some bugs that which we are trying to correct. We, uh, I looked it up in the beginning of this week. We had uh, over 1,000 registered users coming from lots of different countries in the world. And they found out about Collocate mostly from friends and recommendations. Most intended uses is for writing and revising, but some people are using it for teaching and other uses. Most users are PhD students, they're master's students, undergraduate students, but quite a few university lecturers or professors are also using Collocate. And the main writing language um, is Chinese, amazing dissemination in Chinese, in, in China. And uh, I never gave a seminar in, in, in China, so I don't know, it's word of mouth. But look, it's interesting, it's lots of native English or people who have English as an L1 are using Collocate as well. So our next steps are to address some known bugs, uh, to launch the alternative visualization and try it out, and carry out more usability tests. So thank you very much for your attention. And I encourage you to try our prototype. You can access it from the Collocate website. And I would like to thank the AHRC, our research funding body, and also my co-investigators, Professor Robert Lev, Professor Jonathan Roberts, and our brilliant researchers, Gerent, Peter, and Nirvan. And thank you very much for your attention listening to me.